Great. OK, um, first of all, thank you so much for everyone and especially Tom for this great opportunity to present my work and exchange my ideas with, with the audience. It has been very exciting since I monitor several sections of the summer school. I think you probably share a similar feeling as me that there's a lot of uh, wonderful work has been going on over the past several days. Uh, now, I think today is the last talk on Thursday. You have been through summer school to a significant uh, amount. Uh, I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm standing between you and your beer. So I'm trying to do something different to make uh, some alternative, um, thought-provoking, and uh, entertaining presentation in this one. Hopefully, I can achieve the goal. Um, so what I've standing on here, because I'm remote, I can see my screen. Uh, I welcome for, uh, for uh, going into this section, the section, the physical audience and the, the people from uh, uh, virtual participation like me. Uh, I cannot see the um, Q&A section at the same time as I'm moving this uh, 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 slides. So please, uh, if you uh, have a question, please feel free to type in the, in, the, in, the, in the chat box. I think Tom will help to moderate. Uh, if I didn't catch it, um, I will get it later. So in, in this presentation, I basically formulate um, in such a way that I want to present opportunities and the challenges, especially for many students I know in the audience who, who are full of energy and ambition that I want to, want to put them into the right direction to use. So like when I was in a student not too long time ago that I, I don't know what to do with my, my life, uh, actually probably still right now, similar situation. I hope this talk will sp sprinkle some, some ideas about current problems, about current landscapes, and some thoughts about this uh, machine learning in the overarching geoscience. And in the end, I'll finish my talk with a demo of a case study. So without further ado, uh, I'll begin my presentation. Um, I'll start with an analogy. Well, it's not really not my analogy. It's inspired from a good pro uh, uh, manuscript by Nearings. So the author started with a quote in the, in the last day of la uh, last century. Lord Calvin came to celebrate the great achievement in physics. He was so pleased that by the wonderful achievement of Newtonian me me mechanics and the Maxwell equations, which has established the grand mansion of classical physics. There's almost nothing cannot be explained by classical physics. And, and the followers probably have a small things to fix a little bit a bit. But there's also two clouds, as he mentioned. One is a black body radiation. The other one is a maxwell mori experiment. Well, the later one is actually an experiment to look for ether. Well, it's physics. Now, if we have done by chemists, probably this problem has been solved much earlier. But good for them, because they didn't find ether. These two clouds have led to the discovery of quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity. Similarly, in later time, in 1980, Kais Bevan proposed an analogical version of hydrology uh, clouds. One is a scaling, the other one is uncertainty. Um, I would think, like to talk about both, but I think that we make the talk too cloudy, so I want to focus on one. I would love to talk about scaling because I think scaling is the fundamental principle of nature, um, but that takes a lot more effort. And with uh, my observation of our previous summer school, I think uncertainty is one of the uh, topic people have high interest. So I'll focus my energy and time in this presentation about uncertainty. And with these two clouds in hydrology, the author continued that there's not an Einstein yet in, in the field of hydrology. So I think that's very good news for us. We got a lot of room to uh, make innovations. Then how do we approach these two, um, two clouds? Well, the author in the paper actually alluded that 
machine learning is a new direction where maybe we can get more insight about how to think about these two problems. So before I get into the details, let's just review a second about what is actually machine learning is. Well, put it a simple term, it's basically a learning task. You have X, which normally are data input, and you have Y, which is your desirable output. What your goal is trying to do for the whole learning access is trying to find a function that map X into Y. And this, so this course, you need to mean, minimize something called a loss function, which allows you to uh, minimize the, the difference between the foreground, ground truth Y and the um, predicted uh, X based on the function. And normally you split the data into training side and testing side. And you validate the training, then you validate the model with the testing. Now, so I would like to start with this uh, why, which is one of the um, component in the machine learning part. Normally in the context, we call why observation or merriment. Uh, I will see them slightly differently. Let's start with observations. So I'm showing here four graphs. And I think you can see the mouse from here. Um, on the very top left is a kind of a triangle. You, you probably see a, a upside down white triangle, which actually doesn't exist. On the other one in the same first row, you see a blue black checkboard uh, uh, de description where you see a lot of uh, lines that in horizontal direction. And if, if you see these lines in parallel, you are having a very impressive uh, um, mental capability to decipher solution. Normally people see these lines actually not parallel. And in the bottom uh, corner here, you have see a graph, it looks like a person. And you have, you're supposed to see two people. One is a young lady, the other one is a granny. And in the very last one, uh, I think it's supposed to be a rotating 3D uh, syndrome, uh, black and white. If you can see that, that means great, your, your, your brain is functioning, and sometimes I don't see, but uh, that, that's, that's okay, but I think the reason we, what I want to say is, the reason we see these graphs that deviates from the ground truth is that we not only observe, as observe itself, we also interpolate, we also model in the back of our mind involuntarily. So it's not an option. So we are modeler all the time. That's about observation. Then I move on next one to the measurement. So Merriment um, is a very common practice in, in science. Uh, we do merriment uh, in, in the field about concentration of different chemicals. We have different merriments about the disease, about people. Uh, but there's a, some fundamental question to ask about what actually merriment is. So here I bring up a famous example. It's called Schrodinger's cat. Well, I, find, uh, I cannot see actually how many people are very familiar with this example already. I just go through it quickly. So here what you see is, is a box. In this box, you have uh, several things. One is a, is a gray cat in the center, and there's uh, another radiating material with a lever on the top. And this radiating material, if it decays, then it will hammer a, a flask with containing poisonous gas. So if the flask broke, the cat will die. If the radio material didn't decay, then the, the flux be intact, the cat will leave. Now, the paradox came in is that if you, if this, uh, uh, this to describe this particular radioactive material, it has two fundamental states. One is a decay state with non-decay state. And quantum mechanically speaking, this two states forms of superposition. So before you open the box, we don't know what's going on. That observation hasn't happened, merriment has, has not happened. But when we open the box, and we are probably sure that 
the one thing will appear is the cat will that the cat will be alive so actually this is a very good example to show the involvement between the observer, observer and the outcome of the observation so before we open the box the complete solution of wave function of this uh, quantum mechanics is in inside capsulated in the box but the moment we, we open it we can only see one particular outcome if you look at this uh, uh, simple um, solution here we, where we see the, the charging equation described on the in the green is totally deterministic it's not different from the classical me mechanics but the solution of this charging equation is probabilistic so why? What caused the probability? Where does the probability come from? Well, of course, there's going to be a lot of debate. And if you don't really think, you know, this is quantum mechanics um, situation is very close to us or, or very nearby, uh, we can pull back a little bit and look at a more general, more classical scenario. So Laplace has mentioned there is a particular um, paradox called Laplace demon. If there is such an intellect can know about all the position and the momentum of everything in the world, then the whole universe is purely deterministic. There's nothing that we can now know, and there's no reason to be have uncertainty. Like saying here, there will be no uncertainty uncertain and future just like past. But is that true? Well, I will show several examples to counter argue this uh, particular situation. In this example, I'm showing a solution of a simple equation, which is shown here. It's a fourth order difference equation. In this equation, there's a one unknown, which is x, and one parameters r. So what's interesting about this particular solution is the solution of this uh, x really depends so much on the value of r. As you see here, when this r is moving from small number to a large number, this x change a lot. And also, in certain scenarios, for one particular parameter r, you got a different particular value. A value of x, which is called bifurcation. And this is uh, probably one of the most simplest self feedback system that exists to capture this phenomenon and is ubiquitous. It, it applies to um, population growth, it applies to um, our neural vision response to flinker light, and also it's very um, applicable to hydrology especially in the thermal convection in the fluid liquid, which I know uh, Giuseppe has a strong interest in. So take one step further, in a similar phenomenon is called Lorentz system. It's a little bit more complicated. It can be a three simultaneous or six simultaneous equations when Lorentz was trying to simulate the climate situation. And what he did is in, 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 in the beginning, he set up a full set of parameters to let the program run and take a cup of coffee. Then in the middle, he came back, he wanted to reproduce the work. And he started from somewhere in the middle. Just by putting the exact numbers he has used in previous and let the uh, system go. What surprised him is that with the, ex the same input, he arrived at two totally different solutions. So. What I'm trying to get in here is this uncertainty is ubiquitously existing in our system. It's no matter quantum or microscopic system. So how do we understand what is uncertainty? Well, one master said, this is a Feynman, we just don't understand. Or it has to do with how we understand. It's about our way to perceive, to understand. It's about consciousness. And Einstein said there's no 
way to understand the problem or to find solutions if we maintain at the same level of consciousness. So consciousness is a fundamental question that we have to address when we try to approach the question like uncertainty. So this is my view. So what we have here is a, is a merging of two real tracks. One on the left, I labeled as yellow, where I have ML, stands for machine learning. And the run on the right track is labeled green, is uh, labeled uh, green as HL, is a human learning. So human learning has, uh, can be you know, referring to classical physics, quantum physics, or statics, or knowledge. Currently, we have two, seemingly two paths in these two directions. The, the way machine learns, the way human learn, the way human learns. But as this direction continues, the system continues to evolve. There's going to be a merging point that machine learning and the human learning will converge on the same path. And the merging point is information. It's basically how we perceive, precise, and understand information. And why information is so important? Well, it's a bit, a bit hard for me to uh, um, derive the fundamental importance for this uh, machine learning uh, uh, information, but I can read a quote, actually it's also from Einstein. If he said, if all the whole world about the physics collapsed, there's only one thing left that he can trust, is about inf information or entropy. So now what I want to take on is to see how we can um, view this merging phenomenon between human learning and machine learning from a modern perspective. I'm trying to look back to the, uh, the original argument of the paper. You know, we can look for solutions in machine learning to help us get into this two, uh, two cloud situation in, in the hydrology. So when you model, or when you take an adventure, basically you need some guidance. Uh, you can either go down in the valley, in the forest, and taking your compass, that's one option, or you can build a GPS system, like on the right, where you can have a global view of the whole system um, from every corner possible. Well, this is basically your personal take, which approach you, you would like to go on. Uh, I personally would like to choose the second one to build the GPS system. Apparently, it takes longer time and takes more effort. And uh, the other colleagues are more favored this compass approach, which can get quick answers right away. But either way, they are, um, they are equally uh, interesting and can be applied. It just matter how you guide yourself uh, through this mist of understanding and certainty. I think modeling is actually your compass and it's also your GPS system. Okay, so with that all being said, I just want to ask a fundamental question about uncertainty. I think many of you would agree with me that our pedagogical system has taught us from statistics that the geo process is basically a smooth process, like shown here in this blue concrete curve. And then the god came in, starts sprinkle with some noises, like this scattered starts on, 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 this, uh, on this curve, and hide the presence of the underlying real geo process and present a challenge to human intelligence. That's been taught for a long time. But with what has been said in so far, I, I just want to ask you to rethink about this scenario, rethink about this picture, whether it has been validated or whether the validation has been ever asked. Well, Einstein apparently said there's no play of death uh, of the God. In other words, the God doesn't really actually introduce probability in such a way. 
what actually happened is that is that really the noise as we commonly perceive or it's a complex adaptive evolving system it's part of inherent nature of it it's part of uh, inherent sensitivity to the initial conditions it's about the desperate pursue of individual behavior versus to analyze the whole ensemble collective behavior it's 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 basically the difference between the microscopic state versus macroscopic states in this situation the solution the physicist has already advanced in the path is called ensemble strategy which allows us to connect the microscopic with the macroscopic and that's also the central topic of the machine learning part for this presentation which is ensemble learning here i brought up two graphs one is uh, well just one graph uh, i'm going to emphasize there are two strategies one is called bagging the other one is called boosting and there's a lot of literature going on to argue about the strengths and limitation for each of them but actually if you think about it systematically and and put in a different angle look at the situation and you can see and I'll hopefully I can convince you this bagging and boosting pro process is basically the same coin with two sides so let's just go over briefly what is a bagging I think we have talked about random first in the past multiple times probably people are very familiar with the concept basically you have um, a data set you take a small portion of it and uh, bootstrapping with replacement. Then at the same time, you can um, analyze each individual and collect the average behavior. On the other side, the boosting, where you do something similar in the beginning, but the next situation was dependent on first one. Of course, in the end, you also build a lot of scenarios. You can also analyze their collective behavior. So the connection between this is basically a analogy between Monte Carlo sampling versus um, that classical dynamic system. So if you acknowledge the property of algodogity, where you can actually use a simple, single iteration, like boosting here, with this long enough iterations, the sampling effect is actually equivalent to the sampling effect of bagging. It's just a different strategy. Of course, there are just very high level comparisons. They have their own um, technical uh, uh, features, especially boosting. You may have to rely on gradient, then the gradient becomes its own a particular, sometimes pathological, but a different set of issue. So what I want to say here is with my in my opinion, this strategy, two strategies actually converging. So in this presentation, I will just fish out bagging uh, itself as an example. Okay, so now um, I just finished the broad talk about information about the human learning, machine learning, and the uncertainty. And in the next part of my presentation, I'll go through a example that I have done in the past, uh, which not completely implement the principles I have uh, mentioned before, but actually some area uh, eluded certain thinking process. So this example is an uh, access to estimate the concentration of nitrogen and the phosphorus in their different chemical forms in the rivers and streams across the United States. Um, again, in this problem landscape, I just recover, we have three things we need to address. One is the target variable, or is the response variable, or the observations, whatever you like to call it. Uh, also, we need the environment descriptors that we can describe this, uh, uh, this X that can um, 
use to build a function that we can make a prediction of. Of course, we need a linkage between the x and y, which is the algorithm. So I will touch on pretty much every one of them in the following talk um, around these three aspects. Okay, let's start with the uh, descriptors. So as you, as I have already mentioned, that I'm trying to model the concentration of chemicals in river streams. It's not in the air, it's not in the soil, it's in a liquid. And the liquidity is a very important factor because uh, they impact each other. The neighbors, the upper stream, downstream, they have influence along one direction, with the direction of flow. In order to consider this particular dependency, uh, Giuseppe, my colleague, and, and uh, um, Sami Dominic has came up with the idea, so-called carryover effect, when, to build these variable variables. What it is, it's basically illustrated here. So when you have a particular environment, that have variables to influence the um, soil streams. I'm showing here the blue one is a, is kind of a river stream, and the green one is a, a water catch uh, water catchment and the surrounding environment. So what is being built is actually the information from upstairs or upstream has been carried over to downstreams. It's like a picture shown here. If it rains in upstreams the flow in the bottom will increase. Um, based on this principle, we built about 47 different descriptors to describe uh, different ge uh, geographical conditions. It includes you know, elevation, soil condition, land cover, temperature, precipitations. Uh, more details can be found in this reference. Um, then I move on to the next element in this modeling access, which is the target error variable. So in this case, uh, I collected the data from the USGS water quality bottle, which contains um, 160K gauge stations with uh, 50 million raw data spanning 25 years. And I categorized these chemicals into the different forms based on this uh, code, which is shown in the table and I build individual models for each of them using the algorithm of random forest. But before doing that, there's some challenge in this modeling access. Um, the first one came up is called temporal sparsity. So when, when you look at this huge amount of data, as I did in the beginning, I thought there's a lot of information about time continuity. So actually it's not. So many data only were collected at a particular station for a couple of years, then stopped for another years, number of years, may reappear in some number of years later. So I need to come up with a particular random variable or statistic that can help me capture this phenomenon. In other words, to how to describe the, the information richness for each particular gauge station. Then I think about it as I look around, I think uh, one particular strategy came out uh, very useful is coming from information theory, where I use the Shannon entropy as index. So the construction of this whole um, statistics, statistics time sequence integrity was based on these three procedure laid out here. So I start first to calculate the Shannon entropy, which is uh, Categorized by the probability we observe a particular um, year, of, uh, year observation for a particular station and assume the observations are independent. So it's basically a binomial process. And from here, we can calculate the channel entropy for each particular station. Then I take the uh, one minus acquire information density because um, the Shannon entropy gave you the information is a kind of surprising result. So what I actually interest in is how much information it has in there. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the opposite of this phenomenon. Then I, then I um, created this information density index. Then based on that, I take the information density, uh, 
times the, du the duration of all observation, observation time sequence. And that's the TSI, which is time, uh, time sequence integrity shown here. The plot is on the graph, it's a histogram. And the way you read it is basically on the x axis, it's, it's number of years. And the y axis is number of stations. Now, if you look at this graph, note that the y axis is the log, so it's log scaled. There are actually not many stations, it has a lot of continuous observations. So that's all the take from this graph. And actually, I fish out those several stations are actually continuous, more than 80 years for these stations, and put them out um, for each in, in the video station for their time sequence. And I apply the KPS test to see if the trend and the testing result basically rejecting the hypothesis, the trend of 48 stations. All right. so. That, that means we have a lot of data, but they are all scattered out. And how do we use this uh, particular amount of data? Well, we came back with the um, philosophy that averaging or ensemble behavior is predictable, even though individual is very really hard to trace. So I applied the aggregation strategy to aggregate all this 55, 25 years data into seasonal level. Well, whether this access is a reasonable practice, uh, we have to analyze if this, there's a sufficient differences among the seasons, whether there's a sufficient individual individuality among the season that we should characterize and categorize into different ways. So in order to achieve this goal, I tried a trick where I interpolate the moving average of the station observations for each in individual season and compute the different between two seasons. So I use winter always as reference. Then I compute the difference between winter, spring, winter, summer, winter, autumn. Then we got three layers. And three layer differences get the value between this uh, algebra region. Then you merge them, you got a plot. And this plot basically represent how differ between the four seasons. The whiter the color is, means the last significant difference between these four seasons. But any other colors differ from white. That means there's difference between two four seasons. So based on this uh, graph, it indicates there are sufficient variations in many different areas. And of course, there are some other reasons there are not much so difference. But overall, it's reasonable to carry out a uh, analysis for at a seasonal level. The computational algorithm I use to do this analysis is random first, and we are very familiar with. But before we run, run into this uh, application directly, uh, I have done some data transformation. The reason I do that it's because the data, the original observation data from collected from gauge station are highly skewed. If you look at the plot here, the original data for total nitrogen and total phosphorus without any transformation is showing this uh, in this plot on the very um, top left corner. You basically can see significant skewness for this original data. After box cost transformation, you bring this data more or less closer to normal situation. So that's the first step. Uh, I traded the data. And the second challenge is about the data sum point. So this is plot represent the, the data have been collected in different areas across the United States. You see apparently some areas you have more samples, in other words, densely, densely uh, sampled, or some other areas are much more sparsely sampled. So in order to uh, account for this particular situation, uh, I came up with this uh, idea to create a kernel density. So what it means, it means by at each gauge station, I build a Gaussian kernel with an arbitrary uh, distance with the uh, um, uh, the width of the Gaussian kernel. And to calculate 
the, the density under each Gaussian kernel or surround for each station. Then from this uh, Gaussian kernel density, I sample the, um, the observations for the training purpose of random forest. Uh, as we know, that one of the challenges that when, when we do the machine learning, we hold assumption is the joint distribution between observations uh, Y and the variables X uh, should be identical in the training and the testing. But it's something very hard to achieve. Um, what I have done here is basically trying to approximate the identical distribution for the R to Y at least and to reduce the sample bias. So with that, I applied the random forest and did the regression. And this is the uh, sampling model for total nitrogen and total phosphorus. And uh, the Pearson coefficient is used to characterize how the model is, and also the uh, uh, RMSE is included in, in this uh, plot. And of course, I also transfer back the data after modeling so that we can get a sense of the original concentration. The maps produced out of this um, axis uh, is shown in this graph, where you can see uh, we have the information on the map with total nitrogen and total phosphorus, and they are presented in a bivariate bi graph um, situation, where you can see in some areas you have concentration both high in nitrogen and phosphorus, or one, high in one but low in another in this overall situation. And currently, currently you can clearly you can see in these four seasons. They, they show some spatial differentiation among different seasons in terms of this nitrogen and phosphorus contribution distribution. Okay, so basically um, that concludes the, the, the research study. Uh, I want to use the last one minute to, sh uh, to ask and uh, tell you a little bit about me, uh, who am I? Uh, I was trained as a quantum chemist. I will gradually uh, migrated into machine learning after quantum chemistry. I have waded into mathematical biology and many other domains. And recently, uh, working with Giuseppe, I have a high interest in this large scale spatial modeling. Uh, I'm a scientific programmer. I program in a platform for languages. Uh, I have, uh, I'm an enthusiast of a uh, Unix system. I have experience with all the Unix systems. You name it, I've used it. So I hope you find this uh, talk interesting. And please, uh, if you want, you can note the Special College website. We also have a training and uh, teaching events. And thanks for your attention. If you uh, would like to contact me, I have my info here. And thank you so much for your attention. And, and thanks to all my collaborators uh, who, who participate in, the, in, this, uh, present, in this work. So that's basically the end of my talk. And uh, now I'm going to move on to a demo of the uh, NP modeling uh, procedure. So should I jump on into the demo part, or there are some questions people want to ask me at this moment? Uh, let, let's do the demo. Let's do the okay. demo, and then you still have some time where you can ask questions. OK, so um, I'm trying to aim this 45 minutes time slot. So I will uh, do the demo here. So as you will see in the, um, in the, in the Matmos channel or, or on the calendar, this uh, notebook is available on the GitLab. And in case you haven't downloaded it, you can download it from the um, directory here. Uh, I think I can show you. On this calendar, I think that's me. And this is a uh, slide. Slides. Oh, OK. Well, so all right. So this is the Git, but if you can see. So what you do is you did Git colon. But I think this is, uh, this is not working with HTTPS. So this address will allow you to pull the data that I um, I will present in the in the presentation. So this is the, the command you want to use in a terminal. 
OK, so I go back to my presentation. Um, if you have pulled it before, uh, you can pull the latest one, because I did some last minute modification on the, on this code. OK, so now without further um, ado, let's just get into this uh, Jupyter notebook. I think many people are already familiar with it. I will not go into much into the basics. Uh, let's get into the direct essence of this modeling process. So in order to run this code, we have to load in some packages. Uh, I think most people are familiar with pandas, uh, scikit learn where I load a random forest. Uh, they're also training splitting. There's a little thing about the pipeline, which we, we use to train the parameters. I, I'll cover that a little later. And there's also box calls uh, transformation. OK. Um, let's read in, in the data. So the data uh, I have in, in the GitHub, there's a data file called the TN sample data.csv. So if you put the GitHub data folder, and this will be inside together with the code. If so, then you can just load in data. You can see and this data has a lot of information within columns and rows. The columns information we can fish out into this command. The first two columns basically is a longitude and latitude. The mean is basically the aggregated average at the signal level. And all the others, like LU, PRC, all the other remaining terms are the descriptors. As uh, I described earlier, uh, we crafted to build a random first model. And does, what, does it have a time also? Uh, because I, I thought you mentioned that it's like, uh, like a daily measurement or something. Is there um, a time? Or, or is it just a, this is a simple version of the... This is a simpler version. This is a simpler okay. version of this of this access because I, I won't, it won't fit in a one hour frame. So this is already averaged to each season for 25 years. So this is already a seasonal level average. It doesn't have time label on it. So, so here uh, I want to show the um, distribution of the plot. So I plot the original mean, which is the original data. You can see the data is highly skewed. Now, if you apply the box box transformation, so here the variables, the, the data become more uh, normally distributed. So. I will use this transform data as the uh, corresponding variable uh, to make predictions. So in to that, I have to um, make a, a cleavage so that you can have the uh, x and y, which are in the sliced from their column numbers. And I call fit, which is the basically features I will use later. And that we already seen uh, previously from the column names. Now you can check uh, how many X you have, how many Y you have. I have the same number of rows, different number of columns. If there's a shape has some problem, you have to make it, it's mistake in, in the beginning to slice the data. Of course, you can spot errors from here. Okay, so now we have already loaded in the data and part, partitioned the data into X and Y, and we are ready to train the model. So in the training model, uh, I call this particular function called the train test split. That split data with 50% of uh, um, different uh, equal 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 likely to be in training and testing, and I create a training and testing data set. Now, <clears throat> the next step will be basically uh, feed this data into the random forest. Now, as you already know. This machine learning machine has uh, something called the hyperparameters. So does in random forest. So in this situation, I created a pipeline to make it easier for us to explore the parameter space. Here we have max number of features we want to use. That's basically the 47 variables, how many you want to use it. Uh, it comes in different kind of uh, um, Options, you can take a, like ratio, you can take a square root, just basically take a square root of number of variables. You can also provide other options. Um, max number of samples that you can go into the bagging. Number of estimators, because that's basically how many trees you want to build. And the next depth is, is, is the depth of the tree. So if you, if you use pipeline, that's a very easy way to 
chain model for different uh, parameters. And I use grid search CV to use a cross validation and the uh, R R2 score, and basically R square, the, the coefficient determination to evaluate the model. So if you run this, it'll take a minute, depending on how fast your computer is, my computer will maybe uh, take a couple minutes to finish. You see here there are totally 400 plus uh, feeds need to be done to go through the process. Uh, as we are waiting here, um, I just want to the, the, the location without data, without data was not in, in fit into the random forest. So what I did is basically build a coronal density and sample around this coronal density. So if this coronal density is big enough to cover some area that doesn't have data, the density will be included. But if it are so less uh, populated, so far less sampled with rich area, they don't have data at all, the coronal density will not cover. So those points were not uh, considered, were not con included. And in the in training. Okay. And so, uh, is there a danger of you making like a bias estimators, like so that you you basically underestimate some places which could be hotspots? Do you think there is a danger, or or you think you deal with that? Well, the reason uh, that I, th I think I de deal I deal it in some way in the uh, in the data training and and the, and the uh, testing procedure. So basically, I sample the data from the same coronal density where the training and testing are ideally should come from the same same approximated distribution from that kernel. So based on the learning perspective, that's probably the best we can do. Uh, additional information so far, we, we don't have. I, actually, I haven't uh, came up with a method to um, cover that aspect. OK, there's another question about the spatial resolution. Did you um, look at the effect of uh, decreasing or increasing spatial resolution on the model accuracy? Because you say it's kind of, uh, it's important to do have this uh, terrain attributes derived. So if they, are, if they are not so detailed, if they are from coarse resolution, maybe that could degrade your accuracy. Have you looked at that effect? At the moment, you do everything on one kilometer or something like that. So far, so yes, that's a great question. So far, the the resolution of variables that we have is one kilometer. Uh, we don't yet have another one, but I think Giuseppe is working on to process a more refined resolution at 90 meters. So we are going to explore, but the process is ongoing. Okay, and uh, the other thing is about uh, you do this transformation box cox, and then uh, yeah, you do uh, modeling. And then you do back transformation. Yes. Is it is that complicated? Is there any danger that you there was some always this issue with the back transforming skew distributions models? Do you think there's a, some danger to just um, within do? Yeah. So, well, certainly there's a there there's a, a change of distributions because box cross transform when I apply applied it the intention is to try to change the distribution of the initial input data. Then after transformation, what he regard is to train the model. That's the final um, uh, model output. Then the process of transformation is basically a simple mathematical transform transformation. There's no additional noise into it. So I think, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't cause additional um, challenge in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, data variance. Of this okay. particular model. Can you show us this plot with uh, uh, this uh, fit, um, uh, model fit for the four seasons? Can you show that plot? What yes, yes. Uh, I can just show you uh, quite quickly. I just bring up this. Uh, um, so this is the, oh, the presentation. Yeah, it's in the presentation, yeah. If you just do screen sharing, please. Yeah, I'll do the screen sharing. Sharing my screen, yes. I think you can see my screen. Uh, I think this is the one you're talking about, right? Yeah, that this one, this one. So uh, let me see this. So so the summer looks uh, relatively good match, um, and then the which For one? Is, the autumn is the worst. Why will autumn be the worst? Totem. Uh, well, it looks like also in winter there's less observations. Is is that true? 
Yes, the number of data apparently plays a role. I think the, the, the winter and the autumn has less data compared to spring and summer. And also the data representation here, uh, because I scaled everything to the same uh, 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 land, it's the same starting and end point for the x and the y axis. So that's why you see this is kind of a, a little in the corner. But if you stretch it, probably it, it looks something similar to this. Um, in terms of this uh, autumn, Yes, uh, I think that the number of data is, is, is probably one of the concerns. And uh, also, the several extremely high values that occurs in, in the autumn may also cause some problems. If you look at the, uh, the, the behavior of the model, it's basically um, you know, over uh, underestimated the uh, high end and overestimated low end. So if you have a lot of values in some particular area, for example, this one is quite um, reasonably distributed. But if you have the autumn, you have some very high numbers that will impact the model in a certain way. And uh, what, I, what is the blue line? The blue line? Uh, I mean, the, the, blue, the, the blue line is actually if you just uh, draw a regression among all these points, it, it tells you how this uh, data are clustered around this line. And the red line is the diagonal, the 45 degree. OK. Yeah, so the, yeah. Okay, uh, are there questions? Yes, we have a question. I will uh, hear the question, then I'll repeat it on the microphone so we can hear you. Yes, so we have a good question. Uh, this is uh, about um, the random forest doesn't need a transformation, right? You can you can uh, run it on uh, untransformed data. It can be very skewed. The, the random forest it doesn't matter. So um, have you tried uh, doing random forest without transformation and with transformation? Yes, a great question. Yes, uh, theoretically, the random forest um, algorithm doesn't really uh, sacrifice so much from the, the dis uh, distribution distortedness. Um, but actually, in our case, uh, we I have to run both cases before transformation, after transformation. If no transformation, the prediction power is really, really low. And I think the reason for that is probably because the many data they have, there's so much uh, unevenness in the information for area we have low concentration and have very less information when we have a little high concentration. That really skewed the decision making process in a, in a, in a tree. Uh, at the same time, I also see a question in from the question box. It's asking from, um, sorry for my pronunciation, Rola. Uh, covariate are the same for four seasons. It's not better considering some specific covariate for each season. For example, RS data for each season. Thank you so much. Question? Yes, actually, the, the covariates for four seasons are different. Um, in certain uh, variables. So some variables we I described for the 47s, which are annual or average, of course, it'll be the same, but there are also some other variables like you know, precipitation, temperature, they are costed for the particular season. So the variables for seasons, short answer should be, yes, they're different. Okay, uh, I have one more question and that's, uh, you know, we had uh, in this summer school, we had actually two talks on uh, spatial cross validation uh, so that you take account the clustering of points, uh, which you, in your case, you have a high clustering. Um, have you have you applied that? Have you used the information about location of points uh, in the during the machine learning? I couldn't see it from your. In this example, you were showing in the um, the um, uh, the modeling you did with the uh, importing the data and. Um, yes. Yes. I couldn't see. So can you tell us something about that? Yeah. 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 I. I I understand the question. Um, uh, in this particular example, I didn't use the location info. So the reason I didn't use the location info because uh, there's a different kind of philosophy for random forest. So the location info, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it has information about geolocation, but actually I think what really matters is the uh, the closeness in the hyper in, in the um, predictor space, which is described by the um, descriptor we, cra uh, we crafted. So it doesn't really matter if these two locations are physically close or far away, as long as their environment, which described by the descriptors, are close enough, the the run random forest should capture that phenomenon. 
of course, what is a theoretical talking? Uh, I think it's a great suggestion. I should explore uh, this uh, uh, location info in the learning process. Okay. Um, more questions? Okay, super clear. <laughs> We're good if you could turn on your video so we can just see you last time. Oh, I'm online. sorry. I this is a uh, yeah. It just went off and on for multiple times. Thank you so much for hosting me. That's really great. Nice to uh, speak yeah. to everyone. We're very sorry you couldn't come in person. I'm I, I'm I'm really sorry about that. Um, but there will be better times. Uh, yeah. Probably over the next year. Um, yeah. Thank you for preparing all the material and sharing. Um, your your slides are also included in the in this uh, GitHub uh, repo, right? Yeah, that's in the GitHub repo, and also I post it in, in the Mattermost. And if you have more questions in okay. discussion, I'm happy to keep the channel open if that's possible. Okay. Thank you so much for hosting. Yeah. Please ho uh, follow. Still, uh, we have a couple of uh, sessions tomorrow being broadcast, including your colleague Giuseppe will give a whole day tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, on the GDAL and uh, pay, PK tools. Uh, so yes, please follow. Still. Uh, stay in touch and uh, all the best with your work. Thank you so Thank much you so for much. the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Maybe we can clap and give him.